Welcome, everybody. I'm Noreen Savage, and this is Starting Out Bright. I'm so glad you're here. And just to let you know who I am and who I'm not, first of all, I am nobody official with Bright Line Eating, but the program has done a lot for me. I got acquainted back in 2019 when my friend Lori posted on Facebook that she had lost 57 pounds with this program, Bright Line Eating. And if anybody was interested, they could just send her a message. So my hot little fingers got over to the messenger and I asked Lori what the scoop was. And she told me there was a book by Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson called Bright Line Eating. And in the book, Dr. Thompson talks about four bright lines that you don't cross. No sugar, no flour, three meals a day, weighed in measured portions. And when I heard all that, my heart was sunk because I thought there was absolutely no way I could do that. But where was I? I was sitting at 270 pounds. I was in so much pain, excruciating pain in my knee, some plantar fasciitis going on, sleep apnea, snoring, waking up my husband every single night, and the list went on. I was not in a good shape and pre-diabetic too. And I had tried losing weight for over 30 years. So this just seemed like too extreme. But anyway, I got together with Lori and I decided to give this a shot. She suggested I get the book and also get into the Bright Line Eating community, which at that time there was a private group. We eat bright with lines. Now there are many of them, including Starting Out Bright, which is associated with these Zoom chats, and I just got in the group and I sat and watched and was amazed at the transformations taking place. People losing weight, like a lot of weight, not just 10 pounds, 20 pounds that I was doing every other month and then regaining, but 50, 100, and 150. And for the first time in a long time, I felt hope. And I promised myself that if I lasted one year doing bright line eating, that I would do what my friend Lori did. I would post on Facebook and help anybody I could. Well, the year came up and I'm a Christian and I felt God say, Noreen, you can do more than that. You could connect people. Here it was the time of Zooms now in 2020. And I thought, that's great, but who would come? <laughs> but I knew it was so important if we, the people who have been inspiring in these groups, if they can just share their story and give this hope to me when I was getting started and to others who are now getting started. It's just so wonderful. So I'm just so grateful to every single person who has participated either being interviewed or by participating in the Zoom chats, because this is what helps our community is getting to know each other. And tonight you are in for a treat because we have Tina, Tina Brianza Guaida. Welcome, Tina. I am Thank so you. glad you're here. And, you know, we got a chance to talk last week and it was just so wonderful to get to know each other. And I just want everybody to know your whole story. So I'm going to ask you, first of all, if you want to say anything, but I want to just ask you to kind of bring us into where were you in your life 
when you found Brayline Eating? We have so much in common, Noreen, and thank you so much for having me on the program, because when I first started the journey, I too thought, oh my gosh, do human beings actually live without flour and sugar? Is this possible? And it was only through the stories of other people and the transformations of other people that gave me the push to really um, follow through with this. And here I am six years later, um, six living years. happy and free, living happy and free, you know? So, um, I mean, I still have a little ways to go and I'm struggling to get back on track now, but um, within my goal weight range and I've been for five years and I'm not gonna worry about the last 10 pounds. Um, I'm a size four, I feel good in my skin at 53 years old. I feel better at 53 than I felt at 23 uh, with more energy and joy and um, just zest for life than I ever had. And um, I'm not going to let the last 10 pounds ruin that, spoil that, you know. So I found Brightline Eating in 2016. And it's funny because I came across Brightline Eating um, from a friend who also struggled with weight. She was my high school cheerleading um, teammate and we both struggled with weight and she followed a workout guru named Natalie Jill. Okay. And so I, I actually tried to lose weight working out and I injured myself very badly jumping around with 90 plus pounds on my bones and joints and feet. And I hurt myself exercising, trying to lose weight, but I followed the workout guru and this workout guru sent an email blast on September 16th. And the email blast said, this may not be for everyone, but if you, if you struggle to lose weight, this may be for you. My friend, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson is hosting a free webinar today called the badly behaving brain. And when I read that, I thought I have got to watch this webinar. And so I did, it was around 11.30 in the morning and I sat there for three hours, for three hours listening to this webinar and listening to the science behind leptin and behind insulin resistance and behind insatiable hunger. And she was describing, excuse me, describing my life completely and to struggle with food and never being full and um, the, just the yo-yo dieting and the leptin, really the science behind the leptin really had me convinced. The webinar ended and I said to myself, wow, can people, can people really live this way? Is this humanly possible? Right. You know, <laughs> like without flour, I was, I li I'm Italian. I lived on bread and pasta. Are you kidding me? And I used to put so much sugar in my coffee. It tasted like syrup. And I said, you know what? I'm going to try it for a day. And that very minute that webinar ended, I closed my laptop and I quit flour and sugar for one day, for one day, just to see if I could, just to see if I could. Well, I could, and I did. And the next morning I got up and I had black coffee and I was amazed that I love the taste of coffee without a ton of cream and sugar in it. And I tried it for a day. And then I said, oh, wow, I made it 24 hours. Let me see if I could do it another day. So we're on day two. I hopped on the scale on day three, morning of day three, and I lost three and a half pounds. That's encouraging. I, I thought, well, it's mostly water weight and inflammation. Right. As soon as you quit sugar, your body loves you for it. Your body loves you for it, you know? Right. And I didn't know anything about the honey or about all the flowers yet. You know, I just knew flour and sugar, no bread, common sense, no pasta. And... I looked into the boot camp, which was starting up a week later. And I said to my husband, honey, this boot camp is, I think it was $1,000 or $900. I said, what do you think? Do you think we can try it? And now my husband, God bless him, has seen me struggle with my weight. My top weight was 204. I weighed 204 pounds. I'm five foot four. And he has paid for Weight Watchers memberships. And I had gained and lost 60 pounds on weight loss, probably four or five times in Weight Watchers, four or five times in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And gym memberships and books and exercise equipment and 
you name it. I was on the grapefruit diet. I was on the tomato juice diet. I was a fat-free vegan. I gained weight. I could not lose weight. I could not lose weight. I could not keep it off. I did all the things. I did all the things. And he, he looked at me and I said, what do you think? I think this is it. And Susan Pierce Thompson works in Bright Lane Eating is born out of Rochester, New York, which is my hometown. So I thought, oh, God, is this the answer to two decades of prayer? Is this the answer to two decades of tears and prayers? And my husband, God bless him, he supports everything I do. And he said to me, see if they have a payment plan. See if they have a payment plan. Payment plan. And we were house poor at the time. He built me this big, beautiful house, but all of our money went to the mortgage, all of it. So there wasn't a lot of wiggle room. So I wrote to Brightline Eating and I asked if they had a payment plan and they have a scholarship. So I got my first boot camp at half off for the scholarship and was allowed to pay that on installments. And I joined my first boot camp one week later and uh, I lost 20 pounds in the first oh couple months and then Thanksgiving hit. And I, and I was a crystal vaser till Thanksgiving. And I said, you know what? I'm doing so great. One piece of pumpkin pie. And I gained it all back. The no. 20 pounds, and I gained it all back. Well, the story gets better. So then Valentine's Day rolls around. And I said, you know what? I'm going to clean up my act. And from Valentine's Day on, the next eight months, I was a crystal vaser. And I lost about 80 pounds. I went from 204 to 124. In that first year, I did it, even though I went off the wagon. And um, and the rest is history. Here I am, six years later, happy and free and in a right-sized body. And um, But at the time, at the time when I weighed 204 pounds, I was a young mom, stay-at-home mom. My children were eight and nine years old. I had gotten so overweight, first of all, in my 20s when uh, I went on medication for many things. I went on two medicines, but let me backtrack a little bit because I'm blind in my right eye. I'm completely blind in my right eye and I've had an eye disease and rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis since I was a child, since childhood. And I was going blind when I was a child. And the only thing they knew how to treat this uveitis, which is inflammation of the eyes, which is like arthritis in your eyes, basically, in your uvea, Mm -hmm. is by throwing steroids at it. And I had a lifetime of steroids, injections in my eyes, eye drops, and oral, and pills. And in my 20s, I actually went blind in my right eye in my 20s. And all that stress and all that trauma induced a lot of anxiety and some other things. And I went on another medicine And at 27 years old, I went from, you know, 118 pounds and I gained 60 pounds in that first year on all those medicines. Basically from the medicine. And that does happen to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I gained 60 pounds and it only escalated from there. So at the time when I was a mom, now fast forward 20 years, because I was 27 when that happened, I didn't be 10 years. I didn't become a mother until I was 40. So uh, I was eating what my kids ate and I was full of brain fog, full of brain fog. I could not keep the house clean. I could not keep the dishes done, laundry everywhere, toys everywhere, magazines everywhere. I was always losing my keys. I was always losing my glasses. I was couldn't find clothes because they were never clean. Couldn't find my kids shoes on the way to preschool couldn't find my keys, didn't know where my purse was. I was just so full of brain fog. So when Susan Pierce Thompson talked about that in the Badly Behaving Brain webinar, she just spoke to my heart and I felt like, oh, it's not my fault. It's not Mm -hmm. my fault. My brain has been hijacked by all the wrong foods. And as a young mom of little kids, I was eating, you know, peanut butter and jelly, their leftover peanut butter and jelly grilled cheese sandwiches, macaroni and cheese. What do you do when you don't feel like doing dishes and you don't feel like cooking because you haven't gone grocery shopping? You order pizza. Yeah. You boil water for pasta. You know, it's the two easiest things to do. 
and I just gained more weight. So the 60 turned into 80, turned into 90. And then I eventually topped the scales at 204. And I was full of arthritis pain, full of inflammation. I had severe sleep apnea, severe sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is a tricky thing because when you have sleep apnea, you're obese. And obesity causes sleep apnea. So it's just a vicious cycle. It's just a vicious cycle. And I have learned now to never compromise my sleep. I have cured my sleep apnea and my prediabetes. I I take no steroids for my eyes. After three surgeries in the eye I can see out of, I have 20-20 vision. That wasn't always the case. I had low vision in college and I couldn't see very well and I couldn't drive. Um, but now I have 20-20 vision, but I take no steroids, no medicine, no methotrexate, which is a cancer drug they often use to fight inflammation with that I was on for many years. Um, I couldn't go on them when I was trying to have a family. And I take no medicine for my inflammation, none whatsoever. I feel better, stronger, healthier. I sleep sound. I've cured prediabetes. My life is transformed. I like absolutely it. amazing. And now, I have a couple questions about. The, first of all, the eye. Did you feel like you were at risk of losing your sight in your? I left did. Eye? I I did have low vision okay. out of the one eye I do have during college. It took three eye surgeries right to get sight in the sight that I can see out of after I went blind in the other eye. So I did feel like I was. I was going blind. Yeah, I was told. And so to... now, now that you know what you know about sugar and the inflammation, because that's had an effect, and the flour too, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I mean, does your doctor think like, wow, this could have prevented the other eye from going blind, do you think? or They never once said that this diet would have prevented my progression of the uveitis, which is the eye disease. But my eye doctor did say five years ago, Tina, whatever you are doing, do not stop. You know, he was like, whatever you are doing, keep up with it. Keep up with it. Congratulations. Wonderful. I go to the eye doctor. I get a 2020 uh, vision reading and I have tears in my eyes, just some joy, tears of joy. He's like, whatever you're doing, don't stop. Yeah. And the reason I say that too is because it sounds like you had such a strong why. I did. Oh, you had all the reasons, you know, like, as I said in, in the opening, that I thought it's impossible. And that's the first, those were the first words out of your mouth. Is it actually humanly possible mm-hmm. to give up? these foods, you know, sugar, flour, is it really humanly possible? So, you know, we got, we have to have a why. And then I think our why evolves through, you know, as we lose the weight so that we don't backslide. Exactly. Now my why is now I have a flourishing career. I'm a published author. I have students in private practice. I'm currently, for the first time in 16 years, looking for full-time work um, to go back to work full-time after having been home with the kids now that my boys are in high school. And um, my why has evolved from I want to look nice in family photos and I want to feel good on the beach in a bathing suit and I want to enter my 50s gracefully and in a body that I love and that feels strong and it serves me. It went from that to I want to optimize my brain. I want to prevent Alzheimer's. I want to live long. I want to flourish. I want my master's degree. I want to free up the food chatter to allow me to pursue other things. I want to write more books. Like my why has evolved from I want to lose 90 pounds to I want to live a fuller wow. life. And even the other day, you mentioned a really strong why for you is the example you're setting for your boys. How has, yeah. that, how has that turned out? Because well, you know, never, we live in this society where everything goes with the food. Exactly. 
Exactly. And I have two teenage boys who are typical teenage boys. As a matter of fact, my sweet husband. So I was preparing my hair and makeup and everything for tonight. He took them out to McDonald's for dinner, which he does once a week or so. So they're typical teenage boys. However, um, my boys were eating pizza and ice cream and McDonald's and pasta and um, chicken nuggets and all those good things. And now they were skinny little kids. My kids were always low on the BMI chart. My doctor's like, feed these boys. I'm like, I feed them, I feed them. They're skinny little boys that are, that are now teenage young men trying to work out in the gym and gain weight and bulk up. And now my son eats my Greek yogurt with my oats and protein powder and blueberries and mangoes and cucumber salad. And now I've never once pushed this way of life on my children. Never, ever, ever denied them soda in a restaurant. Never once have I pushed my way of life on anyone. And let me just add, now that we're talking about my children, a year after I lost my weight, my husband was a serious home brewer. He had a beer brewing hobby and he's serious, pretty seriously. And he's like, you look really cute family photos. And here I am with a big beer gut. He said, I'm going to join Brightline Eating too. So wow. he he quit his beer hobby. He sold the $5,000 of beer brewing equipment I had in my basement. He quit and he went on Brightline Eating and he lost 40 pounds. And he looks better at 53 years old, more handsome than he ever has looked. And he feels better and he plays basketball with his teenage boys. Oh, that's and, great. Um, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing. Oh, it's this life transforming. It, it really was. Is. So, you know, I want to get back to this brain fog thing. And as we were, we were getting started, you mentioned about this week has changed some things with the one thing. And I just want to kind of give the viewers up, get up to date. Last week, I had a live stream Zoom and I introduced like in the Starting Out Bright group to, to work on one thing, you know, and that thing could be something that has been on your list and it just keeps going the next day, the next day till it kind of just falls off or whatever, but it kind of bugs you. It's in the background or it's just something you need to do to keep on track. And you said that that thing has helped you so much this week. Can you it really has. And let me expound on that a little bit. So you talked about the book you had read called The One Thing. And mm -hmm. in that is the one thing on your to do list for that day that will make everything else in your day fall into place and flow more easily. Get that one thing done and get it done first. Like that to me, and I have a good friend of mine who has a podcast who introduced me to The One Thing last year. But just like white line eating, we need to hear over and over again and join these Zooms every week right. and be reminded of things. I need to be reminded of the one thing. And I love Wendy's daily posts. I look forward to it every day. I got my one thing done, check, yeah. and you get a little dopamine hit in your brain that you checked it off. So that one thing is the thing you want to get done for the day that lets everything else in your day flow. And if, if you accomplished your major task first, you feel better. And you've gotten it out of the way and your day just flows. Yeah. And I have done that. And in the book, I think it actually talks about like one thing, like you do the same one thing, but I switched it up a little bit because I found like, for example, make your bed. That's all great. It's, it's wonderful to have that habit, but it wasn't doing it for me. It wasn't moving my life forward as far compared mm -hmm. to that check that I need to write, mail, you know, get yeah. in the post office right now. That was moving my life. Like those things that were giving me anxiety, mm -hmm. I felt were taking away even from my bright line eating journey. Mm -hmm. Because it could be the one thing of like, I need to apologize to somebody. Mm -hmm. If that thing is holding you back all day, like I really need to, to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, you kind of get stuck in the emotional cycle of anxiety or fear or anything. So it's just been kind of fun. And I was glad that you mentioned it before we went on here, because it has helped. I was doing it with Wendy just for like two weeks. And I'm like, I want to share this with everybody because it's working for me. I just, you know, started doing it. But anyway, that is so great. And I want to get back also to the opposite of the brain fog when you were saying, you know, the, you know, things were not in order, you know, you're very open about that. How did you reverse that? I know you talked about AM and PM routines. Yes. So the boot camp was instrumental in teaching me how to have structure in my life. Because as a stay at home mom, I was getting up whenever I wanted getting dressed at 11 in the morning, sometimes noon, sometimes not even. When the kids were little, they had PM preschool, meaning preschool was either nine to noon or noon to three, half days. So we had noon to three, meaning I rolled out of bed at 1030 in the morning. You know, we had no structure to our day. I was, and I was really just full of brain fog and inflammation. It wasn't a deficit on my character. I wasn't lazy because I had accomplished so many things in my life. And It wasn't just that I was lazy. And that's what Susan Pierce Thompson spoke to me about in the Badly Behaving Brain webinar. So um, the the brain fog and the inflammation went hand in hand together because eating a sugar-free, flour-free diet is also an anti-inflammatory diet. And brain inflammation is a leading cause of brain fog and depression and anxiety brain inflammation, let alone systemic inflammation. I I told you I had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. I have rheumatoid. So I remember my hands and feet hurt me so bad. And I was so overweight and so just so full of pain. I remember carrying my newborn baby, my son Ryan, up the stairs crying that I couldn't even carry. And I was huffing and puffing when I got to the top of the stairs. Like I and I was exhausted. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't crying. I wasn't falling asleep. I wasn't getting up. I had the sleep apnea. And my brother was uh, served for many years as a polysomnographer, which is a sleep center technician. And how he described it to me was this way. So when you have sleep apnea, or even when you skimp on sleep and you're tired, even when you're just tired, your brain, you need energy. When you're tired, you need energy. And what does your brain tell you to do? to get energy, it tells you to eat, Mm. it tells you to eat. That is why I never, ever, ever skimp on sleep. I go to bed at 9.30, I get up at five, seven and a half hours, sometimes it's 5.30, but I go to bed at 9.30, I never ever, and if I go to bed at 10, I will adjust my sleep schedule, I'll get up at six. You know, if it's a weekend, Fridays and Saturday nights, I'm typically up with my boys playing Rami or Monopoly or something, and we'll get to bed, maybe test or something. We'll get to bed at 11. I will sleep in. I never sacrifice my sleep ever, ever. And the Bright Line Eating Boot Camp taught me, and I talk about this in my book, how I set up my morning routine, really taught me to anchor in, anchor in meditation first thing in the morning. And okay. that really transformed my day. It sets me up for peace and tranquility and calm, collected, control, even temperament and a stable mood. It just sets me up. Can you briefly talk about what your AM routine is and your PM? Like, I know that you do the meditation, but that, that didn't happen all at once, did it? It did not. It did not. Um, As a matter of fact, I didn't start meditating until probably three or four months into my bright line eating journey. Because I didn't know what it was. I went to Catholic school my whole life. I prayed the rosary. I actually tried hypnosis CDs to lose weight that weren't effective. And I called into a bright line eating coaching call when I was part of the boot camp. And I said, what is meditation? I, I pray the rosary and I, I do hypnosis. I breathe. But is, is that meditation? And Lyndon Morse Rio at the time has said to me, those are like meditation and they support the brain. But why don't you try the Headspace app, which is a meditation app. And I still really didn't know what it was. 
until Bright Line Eating came out with the meditation bonus in their second boot camp offering, I think in 2017. And Monique Rhodes recorded 60 tracks for 60 days. Okay. of meditation and that's really when I learned to meditate but so I wasn't meditating for my morning routine in the beginning because I didn't know what it was till three or four months into my journey but I was getting up and I do have a daily devotional book that I read and I was reading a scripture and I was in prayer the first half hour of my day from 5 30 a.m I started getting up early 5 30 a.m to 6 the first half hour before the kids were up before my husband was up, before anyone was up, I would get up and pray. And uh, then it morphed into making the coffee and that morphed into journaling. And then by 6.30 a.m., the boys and my husband would be up and my day would be off and running. But really the journaling, the morning prayer was the beginning of my morning routine and getting up in the same spot. In the same place, my husband had made me a prayer corner with an ottoman and a beautiful chair and a pretty table that I could put my coffee and my candle and my Bible. And in his den, I have a corner of the den with an ottoman in my chair that I go, that I pray, that I read. It's set off from the house, so it's quiet. And that location cue, time of day cue, and trigger was my alarm going off in the morning. Um, those three, those are the three components of starting a new habit were really what solidified my morning routine. And now I get up every morning, pray, meditate, um, hopefully in 66 days from now, because on average, according to James Clear and Atomic Habits, it takes about 66 days to wire in a new habit. So in a couple of months from now, I am going to add exercise, which is my next frontier. So I lost 75 pounds. I actually ended up losing 85 pounds, but wow. then I gained back 15 pounds during COVID that I'm trying to take off. And, um, but uh, without exercising a single day in my life. So now 2023 is the year I become an athlete. That's like the next frontier, the next frontier. So 66 days, I'm going to slot in exercise. Um, and I may be starting a new job. So um, I have a lot to look forward to and a lot to dial in and work for in 2023. Fantastic. So if my PM routine, if did so, you want to hear my PM routine? Yeah, I do. Okay. Right around 9.15, I lock up the house. I set the alarm. I set up the coffee pot for the next day. I write in my five-year journal, which is only five lines. It only takes me five minutes. Um, and then I head upstairs, charge my phone, brush my teeth, take my medicine and pray. And that takes all about 20 minutes, actually. And I do that every day. And um, now, did you say you food journal, too? Oh, and I do. I do that. I do that. And usually I forget. And then my buddy sends me hers. And then I'll do mine. Okay. I always send it. Yeah. And then I'll do mine. I do that probably when I put my phone on the charger. That's the last thing I do. Then I'll see the text from my buddy, from my, uh, my who's a crystal baster, by the way. Shout out to Eleanor. I love her. Uh, she is on, I think, day 370 of Immaculate Bright Lines. Wow. And she's coaching me at, on to maintenance now. And um, yeah, so I text her every night my food. And um, I do I do do that every day as part of my PM routine as well. Yes. Now, if somebody was following you around, just like with your food prep, what would they find for you? Do you like get things ready for the day ahead of time? You know, you do the food journal, but do you do prep too or not? I typically will eat the same thing for lunch the next day that we had dinner the day before. If I don't do that, my go-to lunch is hummus with raw vegetables and an apple, which I eat almost every day, or I'll alternate with leftovers. If we have leftover salmon or leftover chicken breast or a leftover pork chop, I will have that for lunch the next day. So when I'm wrapping up dinner, I will weigh out my lunch. You know, when you're packing the fridge with yeah. leftovers and putting away dinner and doing the dishes, I will weigh out my lunch for the next day 
while I'm packing up dinner. I will do that. I have yogurt and blueberries for breakfast almost every morning. Um, I will eat the same thing for breakfast for an entire week. So sometimes I'll have a brown rice and cheddar cheese chaffle, which is made in a waffle iron with rice and cheese and egg. And I'll have a side of fruit, which will be cut up pineapple or mango or strawberries. I'll have that for a whole week. You know, I'll have that for a week. Oh. So, so I'll have the rice made, you know, I'll make a big vat of rice that'll last me all week. Um, things like that. So I do food prep. Um, another breakfast I typically have is just simply uh, avocado toast on Ezekiel English muffin. I'll count the avocado as my fruit. And, and then I'll have two eggs with that as well. So that's the typical breakfast I have as well. Okay. And now I got to ask you with your Italian heritage, you gave me some pictures. Tell, tell me, how do you avoid the pasta for yourself? I mean, because I know that you do the meatball dinners and all of that. I do. I do. So food is my love language. Food is my love language and food is my husband's love language. He's an excellent cook. Um, we both cook together and I still make a big Sunday dinner with sauce and meatballs on Sunday. I still do that. And I have spaghetti squash or zucchini noodles, or hearts of palm pasta, palmetti, um, with bean balls, and a salad, and sparkling water. And um, I love to crank up some Michael Buble or some Frank Sinatra. I actually put sparkling water in my fancy glass. And there's a story behind these glasses. They're gold dipped. And they were actually a wedding gift to my husband's great grandmother in Slovakia. Wow. And they sat in a box in my mother-in-law's basement for years. And she's like, do you want these glasses? And I'm like, I can't want these glasses. And I use them every day. No more do they sit in the box. And I pour sparkling water while I cook. I crank up some Bon Jovi or some uh, Aerosmith or some Michael Buble. I have a very uh, eclectic playlist. And I will play music and I will cook dinner, especially Sunday afternoons after church. And I will make meatballs. My meatball recipe comes right out of the Bright Line Eating cookbook. It is the mo not your mom's meatloaf recipe. Okay. It's a meatloaf recipe. And I get two dozen meatballs out of that meatloaf recipe. And that's what I use. And I make my own sauce. And they get pasta, the boys get pasta. I don't deny them. They're not on bright line eating, but I get zucchini noodles or I'll get spaghetti squash and I have a great Sunday dinner. I and do. you don't feel deprived. Not at all. Not at all. I know that no, the spaghetti squash is wonderful. It really is. It's sauce. I love it that. really is. I make, a, uh, I make stuffed cabbage. I'll use, um, I'll use rice cauliflower instead of rice in the meat mixture. And I'll just weigh out two ounces of meat and two ounces of rice cauliflower inside of every stuffed cabbage. I know what it weighs. And there you have it. You know, there you have it. I also make a lasagna with zucchini. I cut them lengthwise the long way. And I grill them to take the moisture out of them. And then I layer them with ricotta cheese and mozzarella. And sometimes I'll throw in some spinach or some broccoli to add more veggies. And I'll layer that with zucchini. I still cook Italian. Italians eat with a lot of salad and a lot of fish. So when we go to a, an Italian restaurant, I will have broccolini or spinach. Uh, they usually will saute in a little olive oil and garlic. Mm, delicious. And I'll have over it. I don't have meatballs out. I only have my meatballs because there are breadcrumbs in meatballs when you have them out. I don't buy frozen meatballs. There are breadcrumbs in those. Um, I don't have meatballs in a restaurant, but I will have fish. I will have chicken cacciatore. It's a great Italian dish. I make that as well as have it in a restaurant. It's just chicken with green peppers and mushrooms and marinara sauce. And uh, I'll have that over some broccoli rabe or some spinach, sauteed spinach. Restaurants are really accommodating, really accommodating. You and know, I get my I, I'm just wondering, those around you must just be amazed. 
I mean, because I know around me, people are amazed how much I get to eat, number one. Oh, yes. When I actually have, you know, food with everyone else. But I got a question here from Suzanne, and I, I want to ask you this. You mentioned your doctor told you not to stop doing what you are doing. Okay, back, you know, in the earlier part of this. Yeah. He said, whatever you're doing, Tina, keep on doing it. Okay. Have you had the reverse kind of like people tell you that you're obsessed with this lifestyle or downplaying yes. what you do? Yes. How do you react yes. to that? What do you do when you get those kind of comments? Like, that's just so weird what you're doing. I just say it works for me and I'm peaceful and happy. I'm happy. I just tell people I'm happy. I have... Um, uh, a relative, and I want to be careful what I say because they may watch the Zoom, um, the replay on YouTube, who um, lost uh, a significant amount of weight, giving up flour and sugar, eating clean, very similar to my diet. Only she exercises every day, and on the weekends, she has a cheat meal. And she said to me, you should not be dieting on vacation and you should not be dieting on Thanksgiving. And it's too extreme and live your life for your family and worrying about your weight is trivial compared to life and all the things we have to live for. And um, to make a long story short, we became 100 day challenge buddies and now she's asking me for all my bright line eating recipes. So there you have it. There you have it. Just live by example, exude the joy, live the health, stick to your guns, and um, actions speak louder than words. People get it. People and you get know, it. I want to add on to that because um, this is now three and a half years for me, and I'm not to maintenance yet. And I want to ask you about maintenance, but I have had where I was saying I don't eat sugar or flour anymore when people have asked and very few actually have asked. And then I interviewed Dory a few weeks ago and she, she's more like being out with it as far as I have a problem with these foods. Mm -hmm. And so I challenged myself to actually say the next time this like, it's not, it's not just about sugar and flour. I found that I was having some compulsive eating. Mm -hmm. And it's a totally different conversation then. It's not about the diet so much as this is the way I'm maintaining my life. This is just part of my lifestyle now. And that, it, you know, we're in such a diet mentality, aren't we? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, and it brings me to the thing about the yo-yo dieting because, you know, you said you're doing all the tomato soup and all the cabbage soup and all the different diets, losing weight all the time. What did you say the other day? You met somebody, a doctor, Dr. Hyman? Mark Hyman, Dr. Mike Hyman. He wrote the foreword for one of Susan Pierce Thompson's books. I forget which one. She's got so many now. Dr. Mark Hyman. He's a functional medicine doctor that Susan Pierce Thompson introduced me to in an email blast. I watched his Alzheimer's docuseries, which was amazing. And he's a functional medicine doctor who specializes in brain health and naturopathic healing. And he said that when you go up and down in your quest to lose weight, and I told you I had gained and lost the same 60 pounds of Weight Watchers four or five times in my lifetime. Yeah. When you do yo-yo dieting, you actually do more metabolic damage yo-yo dieting up, down, up, down, up, down, then you would being unhealthy at your obese weight. You do more damage with the overweight dieting. And I was, I was definitely a yo-yo dieter, yo-yo oh, dieter. For me, for sure. And, uh, and even now I'm up and down the same 10 pounds, which I really want to nip in the bud in 2023. Like so how are you going to do that with? Well, I, uh, well, I'll tell you how, have, has anybody on here listened to the vlog yesterday? I encourage you to listen to that vlog. That Susan Pierce Thompson came and she comes out with it every Wednesday. I listen every Wednesday. And yesterday's was excellent. It was on about how much self-control we actually do not have when these foods hijack our brains. And it really spoke to me because she talks about how if your brain thinks it's in starvation mode, 
no matter what you do, you are not going to fight your brain and your brain is going to get you to eat. It's going to get you to break your bright lines. It's going to get you to eat calorically dense foods. Mm. And my brain, I have a peanut butter binging habit that I've been trying to break for the past two years. And um, I think it's because I never, I've been in the weight loss food plan, Maureen, for six years, mm. trying to lose that last 10 pounds. And I think my brain is screaming at me, eat more food, eat more food. So just this week, with the help of my coach, uh, my friend, um, and also Portugal is my other bright line bestie, Teresa, who you've had on this show. She also has successfully, beautifully transitioned to maintenance. She has been encouraging me to add food for, for for years. And I finally this week made my first maintenance ad of a full protein every day, hoping my body's asking for peanut butter. It wants protein. It wants protein. It wants more food. I've been stubborn. I've been reluctant. I've been, I was one of those people described in the, in the maintenance module of being afraid to add food. I was afraid to add food because I wasn't there yet. I wasn't there yet. And then I kept breaking my bright lines. So for the past year, I would be bright for a month, then I would break. I'd be bright for 10 days, then I would break. I'd be bright for two weeks, then I would binge. Then I'd be bright for another month, then I would break. You see the problem? I can't get my mojo. Yeah. I can't get, my, I can't get going. I'm going to stick to this protein, even if I don't lose a pound, even if I gain weight, I'm sticking to this maintenance ad because I know my body wants me to eat more food. It's time where did you put the protein? In? Half at breakfast and half at dinner. Okay, because I'm, I'm seeing Deb is saying, yes, eat more protein ads. Um, she lost five pounds once she lost five pounds once she started maintenance. Wow, so, wow. So that's kind of like affirming you of what yes, thanks, Deb. is going on too. Like sometimes um, it's not a cheat. It's is that your body's needing the extra Mm -hmm. food. And which is just blows my mind. It blows my mind that we add food at the end, (laughs) not take more off. Um, I'll read this comment here from Linda. So many people are conditioned to believe that dieting restriction exercise is the only approach to deal with excess weight. Mm -hmm. The focus on our disordered eating is an entirely different concept. As those of us who do bright line eating know, this approach works minus exercise without skinny portions, without beating ourselves up on a daily basis. What a joy to feel free of the diet mentality and the constant starve, lose, binge, regain cycle. Mm -hmm. It was hell. And there are millions just like us out there who need to hear that there's another way. It isn't about dieting. It's about dealing with what eating sugar and flour does to our brains. I think so. Exactly. So true. And then the added benefit of fighting the inflammation that you dealt with for so many years. Mm -hmm. Well, I want, I know that you're not, you're not going to wave a flag and say this, but I want you to talk a little bit, at least about your book a little more. Can you tell us about that? I do know it's available on Amazon and I know that it's a paperback or Kindle, but, but tell us about that. Mindful morning. The mindful morning. Meditate, pray, and love your life. Because really, I told you I started my morning routine with prayer because I didn't know how to meditate. But when I learned how to meditate, it really cracked open my prayer life. It was the key to be regulating my emotions. And I'm a hot headed Italian, so I knee jerk react everything. And it really has transformed my marriage, my parenting, my um, relationship with myself, my frustration with myself. I don't get as frustrated as easily. And I wrote the book for beginners. It's a beginner's guide. It's a one hour read. It does well in 90 minutes, self-help, quick read um, category, um, as well as Catholic self-help. And um, it's a beginner's guide. I talk about my story of having brain fog extensively. and you know, how my thought life was a jungle 
and how meditation just really taught me to observe my thoughts and have space between my stimulus and my reaction and to choose my thoughts and to choose my words and to choose my food and not be impulsive. Impulsivity was uh, rampant and really, it really goes hand in hand with my diet because I'll tell you if sugar and flour, getting rid of those foods was a fuel, was a fuel that helps me banish brain fog and cure sleep apnea and cure inflammation, then certainly meditation was a mechanic doing the tune-ups and the fixing and replacing warm parts. And they work together. And they work setting together. Out, setting your day. Yeah. Or or ending your day or anytime you want. Want to I do, do meditate morning and night. I do meditate morning and night. I'm anxious yeah. to get the book. And Deb says yes to the book. Suzanne's asking, do you pray or meditate first when you combine the two, praying and meditating? I meditate first. I meditate first. Um, and that put it because it's a habit. It's a ritual. It's a routine. Um, and for about 15 minutes, 15, 10 to 15 minutes, and that puts me in a nice, calm state that when I do pray, I know my intention. I know what I'm asking God for. And when I read journal, when I read journal, when I read scripture um, and journal, meditating first just opens my mind and clears it and makes a way straight for the prayer to land well, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Like you are you are in a calm state. and just Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, I just want to add that you had mentioned it is a short read. It's one hour. Yeah, one hour. One hour read. And it actually climbed up the ladder to within the top 50 or 60 books in the short read column. In Did Amazon. you look? Did you just see it? Did you just see it? No, because that changes, that changes daily. That changes okay. daily. Yeah. yeah so but it just fantastic. climbed. I was in the top 20 at one point when the book was first launched. Wow, that's um, fantastic. Well, I yeah. wish you a lot of luck and continued success with that. Um, you know, and as we're wrapping up, I want to ask you a couple more questions. First of all, and it seems so obvious, but what are the non-scale victories that you would really put way up there from this lifestyle, this decision to do bright line eating? Oh, so many, so many. We just went to Canada for a vacation winter holiday and my ski pants fit every year. I never have to worry in the summer if my bathing suit is going to fit. Um, I go ice skating and skiing with my children. I never would have done that with 80 pounds on me. Every time I'd be afraid of falling and, and, you know, and breaking a hip or, you know, hurting a ligament or something, you know, I never would have gone ice skating with all that weight on me, playing with my children, um, better sex life, um, just uh, calm, focus, my sharp brain, allowing me to work and allowing me to write. And um, so many, so many, there are so many. And from what you described before with the brain fog and just, you know, not having order in your life, here you are now getting up at 5 30, 6 o'clock. Oh, five. Versus, Most mornings, 5 a.m. Versus, you know, the let the day will just flow where it is when I can get to it. You know, I, I can imagine that. I really can. Because it's not easy. And then even when the kids are little, sleep deprived and all that. But when you add on inflammation, rheumatoid, arthritis, you know, all of the things, it's just really, really difficult. So. And then you've gotten rid of the sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. I mean, just what a blessing that is, right? Pre-diabetes, pre-diabetes, pre-diabetes. Uh, yeah, and Alzheimer's disease is known as type 3 diabetes. I don't know if you've heard that. No. Type 3 diabetes. Yes, you'll learn that from Dr. Mark Hyman if you follow functional medicine. Type 3 diabetes and sugar and insulin resistance is prevalent. In, in people with Alzheimer's. And I have a strong family history of Alzheimer's. My grandmother is one of 12 siblings and all of them but one 
all of them at one were struck with Alzheimer's. Mm. I have a strong family history and um, I don't doubt for a minute that I'm doing my future self a favor by living this way now. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. And boy, that's really something to think about. Mm -hmm. And even like sleep too Mm -hmm. is a really big deal too, I believe. So here we are at the, the end of this, this session. And it's just, thank you so much, Tina, for, for joining me on this. But what would you say to someone who is maybe like you or like me and, and is saying, is this humanly possible? What would you say to encourage someone to give this a try, right line eating? Uh, first thing I would say is I'm nobody special. If I can do this, anybody can do this. I lived on bread and pasta. If I can do this, anybody can do this. I'm nobody special. My advice to them would be take one day at a time. It is so cliche, but it is so true. It is so true. Just for one day. Just for one day, be bright. Just for one day, write your food down. You could do it for one day. And then get up every morning and do that again. Just for one day. Don't think too far into the future. Um, Another piece of advice I would give somebody is don't weigh yourself every day. I was addicted to the scale. I would see it go down 0.3 pounds and I was flying high all day. And then the next day it would go up 0.1 pound. I was down in the mouth, up, down, up, down, up, down. And really in the grand scheme of things, we don't lose weight linear. How you lose weight is plateau, 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 dip two pounds. Plateau, 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 dip one and a half pounds. You see, you don't lose 0.2 pounds every day. You're right. going to be the same for a week, and then you're going to go down three pounds one day. That is how you lose weight. So going on the scale every day just is insanity. So I would really encourage somebody to weigh themselves once a week, take one day at a time, keep it super simple. I always say kiss. Keep it super simple. Susan Pierce Thompson taught us that the most successful weight loss maintainers eat almost the same thing every day. And I have to say, I do that. If I have yogurt and blueberries, I'll have that all week. If I have a rice and cheddar cheese waffle, I'll have that all week. Um, If I have eggs and and avocado toast, I'll have that all week. You know what I mean? Keep it super simple. I eat hummus and raw vegetables almost every day for lunch. My dinner is the same every night. Four ounces of protein, now six ounces. I just made my maintenance ad. Six ounces of protein, a green vegetable, and a salad. That's dinner every night. Every night. <laughs> every night. It's either chicken piccata, which I make with arrowroot powder instead of flour. Um, chicken piccata. I'll make pork chops with onions. I will make steak, sirloin steak. I will make uh, salmon, grilled salmon. We always have a protein, a green vegetable, asparagus, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, spinach, wow. and a salad. And a salad. I eat the same thing every day. Yeah. So keep it super simple. What a struggle to eat all that great food. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I know. It's almost comical because, you know, when you actually dip your toe in and realize the bountiful portions and everything, it's quite amazing. I couldn't believe it the first week. I said, how am I going to eat all this salad? I couldn't, I couldn't imagine. My salad bowl is big. I have a big salad bowl and it's full every night. And, um, I just wondered how I was going to eat all that food. And I said, am I going to lose weight on this? Because I'd been so used to starving to lose weight. Yeah. And the weight, I was so encouraged by the early weight loss because I lost, like I said, like five or seven pounds in the first week. Then it was like three every week for a month. Then it was two a week. Then it was one and a half. But the early weight loss really motivated me. And really, I had, I knew this was the answer to my prayers. And here I am six years later. Wow. Well, Tina, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. And I loved getting to know you. Do you have any last words for us? My motto, my, my mantra is how much jail time you want to do? 
because when I take a bite of something I shouldn't, I have brain fog that lasts me sometimes a week or two. And sugar detox is a thing. It is a thing. So my favorite mantra is, how much jail time do you want to do for that bite of what you shouldn't have? Yeah. So that's, I've never heard that one. (laughs) That's one to remember. So I'm going to close. Thank you again. I'm going to close as I do each week. Good night. Stay bright. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Noreen. Thank you. So, Tina, how would you like to play Three Question Thursday? Okay. All right. Three Question question Thursday when I don't know what I'm going to ask you, but here we go. All right. You mentioned about in your habits a a few minutes ago about the trigger All of those things. Does does that come out of the Atomic Habits book? It does. And it's in my book as well. I give credit to James Clear every step of the way. But uh, it does come straight from Atomic Habits. The cue, the trigger, the action, the reward. Yeah. Can you break that down a little bit for someone who this is a new thought process? Sure, sure. So everyone, when they create a new habit, actually every action you have is on a loop in your brain. Most of what we do throughout a day is automated. We're on autopilot uh, most of our day, which is think about when you take a shower. You probably first wash your hair, then wash your armpits and shave your legs. You probably have a habit. Or when you get dressed, you probably put either your shirt on first or your socks on last, or you probably have a habit and you don't even realize it. You don't even realize it. And whenever we want to create a new habit, we have to tap into the habit loop. And that is you need to have a cue. You need to have something that tells you it's time to create the habit. And that cue could be your alarm clock going off. It could be when you come in from walking the dog. It could be when uh, your spouse comes out of the shower. You need a, a cue which tells you it's time to do the thing. You need a craving. You need to want to do the thing. You need to create a craving for it. Hmm. That trick that motivates you. And typically your motivation depends on two things, how much you desire the action and how much resistance you are going to come up against. So in other words, if it's a hassle for you to run downstairs and put on your gym shoes, he says, have them next to the bed. Or um, if it's a hassle to grind the coffee beans in the morning before you make your food prep your breakfast, Make the coffee the night before. Set up the least barriers to following through with your new habit as you possibly can. Then there's the action, the actual habit. You perform the action. Then the most important part is a reward. You need to reward yourself for the action, the habit. So in my case, when I meditate and pray, I usually hit the brew button on the coffee pot And then when I'm done, I go get my first cup of coffee, which for me, that always is a reward. That's a dopamine hit. You have to really put some thought into your rewards, something to journal, something to put some thought into. And this habit loop plays all day long with your behaviors. And that comes right out of Atomic Habits. I just gave you the whole book. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important to understand so that you can set yourself up for success, too. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the book writing that you did, you know, the mindful morning morning. How long did it take you? I mean, what you've been doing new habits, new AM PM routines. I mean, your life has just totally changed. Now you're writing a book. Were you surprised by what it took to write the book or were you able to just do these habits and, and be very, you know, Precise every day, I'm going to write a little bit. How did you manage that? Such a project like that. The book flew off my fingers. The book flew off my fingers. Um, And it was, it actually is only 60 pages long. And it was a book to teach me 
how to publish my own books. And many people in the class that I'm taking um, publishes anything, just slap anything on the page. And I thought, if this is has my name on it, I want it to have meaning and I want to help somebody. And I made it a little bit longer than the recommended uh, first book just to learn. But actually, I'm quite pleased with it because a lot of it's going to be released on Audible later this year. And so many people love to pop in the headphones, pop on their bike, pop on their treadmill, in their car, on the way to work, and listen to an audiobook or listen to an Audible. And this is something you can do in an hour and get so much out of it, so much out of it. And I'm really proud of the book. And it just blew off my fingers. It really did. That's fantastic. And you mentioned Audible. Do you have any favorite podcasts? This is question number three. This is for all the money, all the marbles. Do you have any other resources, podcasts, anything that I, I go do. to for you? I do. Um, Pruning to Prosper podcast, it's called, uh, by Gina Morton. Um, Pruning to Prosper is decluttering all the stuff in your life. Oh. So that you can hear from God. Pruning she, to prosper. Pruning to prosper. She talks about meals, money, mindset, and decluttering for the Catholic mom. And anybody can benefit from this. Anybody, sincerely. And a lot of meal planning. She talks about a lot of decluttering. A lot of personal development. Clearing the, the clutter from here. Mm -hmm. clearing, and that goes hand in hand with my meditation, with my book with Bright Line Eating, clearing the food chatter, clearing the clutter. And she comes out every Wednesday. I'll usually do food prep when I listen to her in the morning, chop my salad usually. And yeah, I love that podcast. Well, that is great. Well, Tina, again, thank you so much for being on Starting Out Bright, for sharing your story. And thank you for playing Three Question Thursday. <laughs> thank you, Ari. It was so much fun. Thank so you so much for having me. Thank Take you. Care. Good night, everybody. Stay bright. Bye.